Hey class, I wanted to do a couple examples um, worked out from the quiz review. We're going to review binomial probability and then standard deviation and mean. So the binomial probability is the one I want to review. The formula, remember, is um, P, probability of having R successes. We use combinations, so you do n combinations of r, and then p to the r, and then q times q to the n minus r, where n is your total number of trials, r is your successes, how many you want to be successful, p is the probability of success, and then q is probability of failure. So the first two, we're just setting up the equation. So if I want, I have n total trials, and I want two successes, p of 2. And if my p equals 0.2, then my q would be 0 0.8. So I have 20% success rate, 80% failure rate. So then it would be um, n combinations of r. So I would say 12, choose 2 times p, so 0 0.2, and then I want two successes, so 2 to be successful, and then 0 0.8. If I have 2 out of 12 that are successful, then 10 are unsuccessful. So remember that these two will always add back up to your front number. And then remember you go under the math key and over to the probability section, I think, to do the combinations is the third choice. You put the 12 in first, then choose that probability choice, and then 2, and then finish multiplying that out. In your calculator, you should get the decimal 0 0.28347, which we could say is approximately 28% probability of having two successes. Now, if you need at least three successes, then that's the probability of at least 3 is greater than or equal to 3. And you could find that by taking the probability of 3 plus the probability of 4 plus the probability of 5 plus the probability of 6 because there were 6 total choices. Here my probability of success is 0.35 so my probability of failure will be 0 0.65. Those two always add up to 1 or 100%. So this one requires a little bit more work. So I would find the probability of three successes, then you find the probability of four, and then five, and then six, and then you get each of these decimals and then add them up. So my equation for probability of three successes, it would be um, six choose three to be successful, 0.35 to the third power, so three successes, 0.65 to the third power, if I have three, three successes, I'll have three failures too. In the calculator, I got 0 0.23549. Then I have six choose four, so it'd be 0.35 to the fourth power. I want four to be successful this time, and then if four are successful, then two are unsuccessful, so 0 0.65 to the second and I got 0 0.09510, 6 choose 5, so 0.34 to the 5th, 0.65 to the 1st. And in my calculator, I got 0 0.020484. And then 6 choose 6, so all 6 of them are successful, which means that I would have no failure so to the 0 power on the end, and I got 0, 0, 1, 8, 3, 8. And then to find the um, total probability of at least 3, then you add, sum the total, and I got 0 0.352912, or approximately 35.2%, or I guess 35.3%. So there is another way to do this. 
um, the opposite of p greater than or equal to 3 would be p less than 3. And we could do 1 minus the probability that you get something less than 3 or successful, which would be 1 minus, and then you could find the probability of 0 plus the probability of 1 plus the probability of 2. And so that one would have had one less to do, but you would have still had to take that then that decimal and subtract it from one. So essentially it would have been maybe the same amount of work. In history class, Colin and Diana both take a multiple choice quiz. There are 10 questions. Each question has five possible answers. What is the probability that Colin will pass the test if he guesses an answer to each question? And then what's the chance that Diana will pass the test if she studies so that she has a 75% chance of answering each question correctly? So Colin, we're just going to assume that he has a standard chance to guess a question. Each question has five possible answers. So the probability that he gets it right is one right answer out of five or 0.2, 20% chance, which means the, the chance that he gets it wrong is four of the other choices out of five or 0 0.80. So P is 0.2 and eight is, or Q is 0.8. There are 10 questions. So N is, <clears throat> excuse me, N is 10, and here Colin wants to guess, and we want to know if he will get them, if he will pass the test. So to get a passing grade that's 60%, and which means he's have to get 6 out of 10 correct on his quiz, or more. So we want the probability of 6 right or more, which is the probability that he gets six right, plus the probability he gets seven right, plus the probability he gets eight right, plus the probability he gets nine right, plus the probability he gets 10 right. So our formula would look the same. We're gonna use the n combinations of r, p to the r, q to the n minus r again, but in each one of these are r changes. So in the first one, n would be 10 in all of them, but in the first p of 6, would be, r would be 6. Here, r would be 7. Here, r would be 8. r would be 9, and r would be 10 on this one. And then, so I did this, I found all of those decimals, and then you find the total, and I got 0 0.0063, or approximately 0.6% chance. So he has a very low percent chance that if he guesses, he will... Um, get these right. Now in the next question here, mm -hmm. Diana will pass the test if she studies mm -hmm. the, that she has a 75% chance of answering the question. So this time P changes to 0 0.75 because she studied, so that increases her probability of answering the questions correctly, which means she has just a 0.25% chance of answering them incorrectly. And she's going to pass the test, so it would be probability of six or more correct as well. So you would do the same thing. You'd have n equals 10, and you would use the formula n choose r, p to the r, q to the n minus r, and you would do it for six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And then I didn't finish solving this one. So the first one would be 10. Um, first, plugging it in, you'd have 10 choose 6, 0.75 to the 6th, and then 0.25 to the 4th, and so, far, so forth. I did bring my calculator home, so, and I didn't finish solving that one. So you might have to get the answer on your own for that one. Um, there is another way to do this one as well. So the opposite then would be P would be less than six, or that would be the same thing as P is less than or equal to five. Now in the calculator, under the second, if you go to second, there's a calculator button that says VARS. And above the VARS button, you'll see that it says like distribution on top there. So that 
those distribution functions, if you go down to, I think it's alpha B, but it's like binomial C PDF. I can't remember which one it is now. Let me look here real quick. Yeah, it would be binomial CDF. So if you type in the binomial CDF one, and then you put the, the less than or equal to, so you have 10 trials, um, your P is 0.75, and then you do comma 5, and this will actually give you, the binomial CDF will actually give you less than or equal to 1. So this one adds all the totals for anything below your highest R value. So this, it goes, these are your Ns, then your P, then your R. And you always have to use the R that's like less than or equal to the 5, so it'll give you, it'll add everything up from um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then you have to take that and subtract off the decimal that you get in order for you to get the greater than or equal to 6. I might have to explain that better in class, but I found a video that explains it nicely um, online too. So I'll show you guys that when I get back. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that one. I'm gonna come down to here. This one was one that I also um, am going to skip for now, and maybe I'll go through it with you in class, but you have to use your calculator to do this one, and it's the binomial CDF function. So I'll post an article that I found that kind of explains it too, and I'll go through it with you in class. But if you did 50 times and at least 15 or mo at most 20 without this shortcut rule in your calculator, it would take you forever to do this. So we're going to skip it for now. Uh, explore the calculator button if you'd like and look up some information on that. So I found it by just typing in Google TI84 binomial CDF, and then I found a whole bunch of videos and, and different explanations for how to use that function. Okay, so this is reviewing that standard deviation by hand, so I wanted to do at least one of these with you. Marcy and Nick are in the same biology class. The following are their semester one test scores. Calculate the mean and standard deviation for Marcy and calculate the mean and standard deviation for Nick. So the formula which will be given to you is sigma, the standard deviation, is equal to, you do the sum of all of the x minus the averages squared, and then you divide that by n, where n is the total number of terms that you have or data points. So we have five tests. So this n is five, and here n is five. Finding the average for each one first, you add up the total and divide by five, and I got Marcy has an average of 80.4, and I got Nick with an average of 79. So then I'm gonna do Marcy's standard deviation first. I like to use a table just to kind of organize. So I put my X's in first, so 70, 75, 83, 85. And then you do X minus your average. So these will be all my X's minus that 80.4. So like 70 minus 80.4 equals negative 10.4. And then your next column, you're going to square that x minus the mu squared. So I'm going to take negative 10.4 and square it, and I got 108.16. And then you do that for all of her values here. Am I missing one? 89. So then 75 minus 80.4, I got negative 5.4, negative 5.4 squared, then was 29.16. Then 83 minus 80.4 would be 2.6. Then 2.6 squared is 6.76. Then 85 minus 80.4, I got 4.6. 
and 4.6 squared, I got 21.16. 89 minus 80.4, got uh, 8.6, 8.6 squared, I got 73.96. And then you need to find the sum, the sum of all the x minus the average is squared. So I have to add all these numbers that I got, the squares added up. So I got 239.2 for that sum of the squares. So I can plug that back into my formula now. So the standard deviation will be the square root of that sum, 239.2, divided by your n, which was 5. So figure out what's inside the square root first, and like the divide the fraction first, divide the number by 5, and then take the square root, and you should get 6.92 for mercy. We do the same thing for Nick. So Nick's test scores are 72, 74, 89, 94, and 66. And you do X minus his average. Now his average was 79. So 72 minus 79 was negative 7. Then negative 7, the next thing you want to do is square those values, so 49. Then 74 minus 79, I got negative 5. So I subtracted all these, and I got 10. Then I got 15, I got negative 13. Then square them. Remember, anytime you square a number, it's always positive. So I got five, 25 there, 100. 15 squared is 225. And 13 squared is 169. Then I find the sum of all of these x minus the averages squared. So I add up all those numbers, and I got 568. So then the standard deviation is 568 divided by n, or divided by 5, and then the square root of that, and I got 10.66. So since Marcy has a smaller, closer to zero standard deviation, her test scores are more consistent. So Marcy, standard deviation is lower, which means her scores are more consistent. Um, now, I could have answered this question probably consistent before I even looked and found the average. So just look back at the data. Look at she's got 70, 75, 83, 85, 89. So two mid-Cs and then a few Bs there. But Nick, he's got 72, 74, 89, 94, 66. So he's got... A, B's, C's, and D's in his scores. So I could tell just by looking at the numbers that Marcy was lower. But the standard deviation tells me that she's more consistent. It also gives me the range um, and how consistent those numbers are, clo how close they are to her average of 80. So, okay, hopefully that was helpful. I will see you guys tomorrow.